Hello, everyone, and welcome to Uncivil Law. For today's case, we have a Title IX issue coming out of a college. This is Rebecca Forrester versus the Board of Regents of the University of Michigan. In this case, Ms. Forrester was being subject to unwanted treatment from a fellow classmate to a degree that potentially interfered with her ability to get an education. She is suing on the basis that the university did not do enough to protect her. And so the Court of Appeals is trying to determine the degree to which the university might be liable for the actions it took, and perhaps even more importantly, failed to take as it relates to this situation. So let's look at this. Foster and another student were both part of an off-site executive MBA program based in Los Angeles through the University of Michigan School of Business. As part of the program, the students occasionally took part in residences, which were once a month, month weekend educational sessions at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel in Beverly Hills. Nice venue. The students would check into the hotel on Thursday night, take part in all day sessions on Friday and Saturday, and check out on Saturday night. Foster developed a friendship with the respondent in fall of 2012 through the spring of 2013. She did not have a dating or sexual relationship with respondent. Respondent began sending her complimentary texts to Forrester and began expressing a more intense, hence, romantic interest in her. At this time, he began giving her unsolicited gift, informing her that he be beguiling, that she held beguiling power over him and suggested he wished to date or marry her. Okay, that's a lot, but all right. In addition to the unwanted physical contact between September 2013 and February 2014, the respondent repeatedly expressed romantic feelings for Foster, despite her clearly rejecting his advances and informing him that he, she wanted a platonic friendship. On February the 28th of 2014, after receiving a series of messages from respondent regarding his perception of their failed relationship, Foster called respondent, told him he should seek professional help, and asked her not to call her about romantic interests in her anymore. After the respondent sent Forrester several text messages on the 9th and 10th, to which she did not respond, the respondent sent her a text message on the 11th saying, Do I creep you out? Foster responded, No, you're scaring me and I want this to stop. The two exchanged several messages thereafter, with Foster accusing him of trivializing the way she felt. This, this sounds like a guy who, who does not have the ability to take no for an answer. And it's like, you know, this is, yeah. In March of 2014, Foster reported the incident of sexual harassment to the University Office of Institutional Equality. Over the next few days, the t them and the Title IX coordinators from the university were in touch with Foster to interview her and collect documentation corroborating the report. What corroboration was there? I'm glad you asked. On March the 18th, 2014, Foster provided them with 300 screenshots and 900 text messages the respondent had sent to her and evidence of gifts and letters she received from him. I'm not 100% sure I've sent 900 text messages to anyone. That's a lot of text messages, ma'am. Yeah. She also raised concerns about online sessions taking place the next day. Specifically, she did not want them to respond to know that she'd be attending. On March the 21st, 2014, the Vettingler contacted respondents scheduled a meeting to discuss the Foster's allegations. In a subsequent email that day, they finalized plans, plans for the meeting and stayed in the meantime, and instructed to have no contact with this other student. This includes direct and indirect contact, includes conduct in person, by email, by text message, by phone, or through a third party. In addition, as you read the student sexual misconduct policy, the university prohibits retaliation of any kind, so you're instructed not to retaliate in any way. When it began to investigate the complaint, the university developed a set of interim accommodations in response to concerns. One accommodation the administrator discussed internally was where respondent would stay and eat during the upcoming residency. On Saturday, March 29th at 1145, respondent sent text message to Forrester and stated, really? That next same night, Forrester notified Vellinger of that message, saying it was very disturbing and asking, should I make further arrangements for my safety at this point? The next morning, Vellinger responded, I will address this text with the respondent tomorrow. As to your safety, you are the best judge of your immediate needs. Please keep me informed if he makes any other contact. On March the 3rd, 31st, Claire Heyinger, Managing Director of the program, sent Forrester and respondent separate emails enumerating a list of accommodations for the residency, which would begin in a few days. Hogiten, Hagiyan, Hagiyan, also stated she would be present during the residency to ensure compliance. Foster was unsatisfied with the accommodations. In correspondence that day, Foster stated the accommodations do not address my safety, and she did not want to be in the same room as respondent during the upcoming residency. She reiterated that respondent had violated the no contact order with his March 29th text message, 
And here I point out that by no contact order, we're referring to what the school did. So this is not a co no contact order from a government, which, you know, incidentally is one of my like broader criticisms of Title IX in general. Like, you know, if this is a problem, why not just go to a judge? Is that not an option? If not, why not? Like judges do no contact orders all the time and they do them on an emergency basis, you know, for exactly this reason. So like, why is the normal system, like if, you know, if, if anywhere else in the world, someone has a problem with someone else, then they go to a judge for a no contact order, right? That's what you'd normally do. So why not do that here? You know, why not go to a judge and get a no contact order? It looks like you have enough ev evidence. You have like 300 screenshots and 900 messages and proof of evidence and proof of all the rest of it. So I'd imagine a judge would issue a no contact order and then it'd be issued by an actual government authority, a judge who then the police could enforce. And then also the university being also government actors because they're a public university, right? Them also would have to give full faith and credit to the judge's decision. So like, why not just go to a judge and get them to do it? I mean, you know, putting aside whether the university could or should have done more, it's a little unclear to me why, you know, why don't we just go get a judge and get them to do that? This is one of the things judges do. This is not their first rodeo. So they would have a better idea of how to evaluate the evidence and all the rest of it. So not quite understanding that personal component myself. And violating a judicial order for no, violating a judicial no contact order obviously has massively bigger ramifications than violating a request from some Title IX coordinator, not quite the same category of defiance. Foster also inquired how she was expected to handle class participation, how to manage breaks during class sessions, given that, for example, she'd have to cross paths, and how the university would address the desire not to see him and for not to see her, including a social function, and whether the respondent was able to discuss with others in the investigation why accommodations had changed. Later that night, respondents sent a crude email to various university administrators. He referred to the Title IX investigations as a, as a witch hunt and specious, nice word choice, and referred to Foster as your psycho ho beast client. Never heard that one, nice. And lying slut whore. He also stated that if you think for a minute I'm either going to miss an upcoming social activity or abruptly depart just because of some lying woman who seeks baseless, vindictive retribution. You've got an inflated sense of your own influence. And with that, another thing coming. I rec why are, do, you want, do we not believe in capitalization or spelling? We are, we are a student, right? I recommend you protecting your shrinking violet client by informing her and in fact be there. If she or you have a problem with that, you're welcome to pound sand. You know, again, this will be a kind of reason why, at least to me, one of the questions I'm asking is, among other things, why not go to a court? Why not get an actual no contact order from an actual judge? Who can actually enforce it with actual laws? You know, that, that's a good question. You know, you know this, this guy saying to a random administrator, I'm not going to obey your no contact order, you know, is not quite the same as I'm going to disobey your, this judge's no contact order. You know, one carries significantly broader ramifications than the other. So among whatever other relief, why not go to a judge and get them to issue an order? Judges do this. You know, it's one of the things they do. Uh, Stephen Bartles asks me, does Title IX prohibit using a judge, and does she have to go th to a judge? No, Title IX gives her an additional claim of relief. It doesn't foreclose other relief. So Title IX gives her a right that can be enforced. Also, it's a statute, and can be enforced by a judge, too. So Title IX gives her a claim to sue or to ask for emergency relief or emer emergency petition. So she it gives her a basis, too. So Title IX gives her some ability to impose on the university, but Title IX, as well as just like general law in general, dealing with harassment and unwelcome, unwelcomed uh, things would give you Title II there. So why not go to a judge and get them to issue an actual order? Or why does the university go to an actual judge and get them to issue an actual order? If it's that bad, if it's this big of an emergency, if there's apparent actual threats, why not go to a judge and get them to issue an actual order that has actual binding authority? So I know of no reason you can't get both. According to Foster, in subsequent conversations, Foster learned on Friday morning, Bellinger and Anthony Watts Wallersby, a Title IX investigator, had told them to remove respondent from the property, but Hollinger kept him in the classroom because she believed there were no imminent danger and thought removing him would escalate the situation. Okay, well, you know, different levels of government are, dis are, are arguing about, like, the best thing to do. Okay, you know, I'm not sure whose call this is. I'm not even sure it's necessarily the wrong call. But again, if we went to a judge, we could solve many of these problems. Foster claims that during classroom breaks on f Friday, April the 4th, the respondent violated their interim accommodation in numerous ways. He stood in front of her way of an exiting classroom, which probably qualifies as kidnapping under the letter of the law, 
Second, he stood in front of a beverage table during the direction of the break, preventing Foster from getting coffee. And third, while Foster was away from the desk, he responded, stood near or sat on her desk while speaking to the professor, preventing her from returning. Later that day, a respondent was in the lunchroom, which prevented Foster from getting lunch. Pro professor Metha asked Foster if she needed help, and Foster responded, What is happening here? None of the interim measures are being held out. Foster testified that she had to be very discreet in this conversation because she's seen next to two students, and they're wondering why they could not enter school. Oh, Matt. Oh, Matt. Matt, Matt, Matt. Matt. You didn't learn. You didn't learn. We had this discussion already. We had this discussion when we reviewed your bar exam answers. Remember, we had this discussion about the difference between criminal law and civil law. So I said kidnapping. You say it sounds like more false imprisonment rather than kidnapping. But one of those is civil and one of those is criminal, Matt. Did you confuse your civil and criminal again, Matt? Did you confuse your civil and criminal law? These are two different things, Matt. They, and it can be both at the same time. Don't stop, stop conflating criminal and civil law. You'll be better on your bar exam answers, Matt. Kid, and, and, and kidnapping is the criminal charge, Matt. Kidnapping is the criminal charge. False imprisonment is the civil charge. So if you're saying, if you're saying, if you're saying it sounds more like false imprisonment, and you're saying it says it sounds criminal, you are saying two entirely different things. You can't say both of those at the same time. Kidnapping is the criminal. False imprisonment is the civil. Try again, Matt. <laughs> Try again. No, don't go away because you'll learn things. You'll learn things. Yes, kidnapping is the criminal charge. False imprisonment is the civil charge. Don't confuse one for the other, Matt. You'll do better on your bar exam. That evening, respondent attended a karaoke event he referenced in his late email. Foster did not attend. Late in the evening, however, she notified that the respondent had posted to the wall, calling her a scrub and making a threatening comment about the boyfriend. On Saturday morning, April the 5th, Hogan called the Hyatt Regency Hotel, where respondent was saying, asked security to go to the room and inform him that he's not to report to class for the day. Shortly thereafter, the respondent spoke with them, who informed him that he had violated no contact order, again, issued by random administrator rather than judge, you know, which carries, again, a different things. Shortly thereafter, respondent spoke with Hogan, who informed him they had violated no contact order, and therefore, he was disallowed from attending class and should not come to the class that day. The respondent did not attend class. He did, however, write an email to several classmates to, to, with a subject line explaining my reg regrettable spelling regrettable absence today, which he provided background the investigation state because he violated no contact or he's barred from attending class. This email included the following statements. Good. I engaged in an inappropriate relationship with our classmate, Rebecca Forrester. Uh, this guy is fun. Yeah. Uh, his, her claim is false, baseless, and vindictive. She is a mean, awful person, a wackadoo chick. My what time we had her bed and mine for a few months there. Oof. This 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 guy is special, man. I have no malice for her. I can t I can I can just tell the lack of malice. The the lack of malice is dripping off the page. Lord have mercy. I have no malice for her, and she'll be ever grateful for the day, ever grateful for her sharing those world class dot dots with me for a while. <laughs> oh man. Oh Lord have mercy. This guy uh you know. I, I am I am by no means an expert on domestic violence law by any stretch. I am no by no means a, a, a an expert on like the things that might do red flags or or subtle signs or things like that. However, given I'm a reasonably well educated guy, you know I've, I I know things in in general a lot, and at least to my very uneducated mind as to the specific domain. These statements strike me as red flags. These statements strike me as a guy who does not have it all together. This guy, this strikes me as a person who is an imminent threat to himself and others. This strikes me as a problem. Now, again, I'm not an expert in this domain. You know, I'm not an expert in this domain. So maybe to an expert, this sounds perfectly fine. However, to me as a lay person, I'm looking at this and like, we've got a problem here. We've got a problem. That's what strikes me. Don't know if I'm alone on that one. You know, don't know if an expert would disagree with me, but to me, it's like, this is not good. We should do something about this. Wow. 
On April the 29th, Foster informed Holy Gun that she and Lauren responded would be traveling to Ann Arbor for commencement through Facebook and converse, conversation with two other students. Foster informed Hoare again that she had a restraining order in place, but, perceived, but believed it only pertained to Los Angeles. Hold on, we missed something. Aha. I apologize. We, we, we missed the line. We missed the line there. So we have to go back. Let's read that other line. Okay. On April 17th, Foster obtained a restraining order against responding to Los Angeles. Okay. So, so finally, 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 we have done the thing we probably should have done much earlier in this process. Someone somewhere should have done this probably much earlier. But finally, Forrester went to an actual judge and got an actual restraining order that has actual force of law to it. You know, it sounds like something that probably should have happened earlier. I Make no mistake here. I'm not blaming Forrester. You know, I'm, blaming, I'm not blaming her. You know, she thought the university was there to protect her, which apparently it wasn't, which is amazing given the Title IX cases we've seen. It seems like more often than not, the university will bend over backwards to give very dubious allegations full force and conduct, you know, witch hunt, uh, star chamber-like proceedings. This doesn't strike me as one of those situations, however. This kind of strikes me as the opposite. So, you know, I don't blame her for going to her university. I do blame the university for not saying, like, go to a... I, I do blame, like, not this. But finally, someone took a hand and actually went to an actual judge and got an actual restraining order that has actual force of law. Yay. Thus, we will read that other sentence now that we know that there is an actual restraining order that actually exists from an actual judge with actual force of law. Okay. Then, on October 29th, Foster informed that she had responded respondent would be traveling to Ann Arbor with two students. Foster also informed Ho again that she had a restraining order in place, but she believed it only pertained to Los Angeles County. Okay. Uh, so, and then I'll read the rest of this too. Hogan testified that until it became clear respondent would be traveling, we were up until that point operating under the hope, the hope, wow, geez, that sounds real promising. We're operating under hope in light of this situation. Geez, oh Lord. We're operating under the hope, if you will, that it follows his attorney's advice or direction and not come. You know, I'm not sure going on a wing and a prayer was necessarily the best course of action in this situation. Once Forrester informed the university of Respondent's Post announcing his intention to attend, administrators had to get an emergency get-together in which they put into action a preparatory plan. Or, you know, you could just look at the restraining order and see what it says. Because, you know, it probably is relevant here. On the night of April 29, 2014, Forrester... Forrest was in a common lounge area, the executive residence for the graduation gallery, which she saw respondent through a reflection in the glass in the same room as her. This just gets creepier and creepier with every passing moment. This guy has problems, man. This guy has problems. I don't know what they are, and I have a little bit of sympathy for him, but I have way more sympathy for her because he is a danger. You know, I don't know what's going on in his head, but Lord, he looked, stood up and looked at her. She went downstairs to the lobby hotel where she was put in charge with Sergeant Hicks, the plainclothes officer stationed at the executive residence in case the respondent appears. So there was actually a police officer there, thank God. Hicks and another officer told respondent to leave the executive residence. The next day, Forrest provided the university with a copy of the restraining order. And after it was determined the order extended to Michigan, because of course it did, because the way these things are ordered, they are general, right? Because like the court, the court that issued this has relevant jurisdiction, like everywhere everywhere it's a court of competent jurisdiction and you know when we're talking about like nationwide injunctions like we're only talking about in this case one person right as opposed to like broader issues so a court in la is issuing an injunction which probably says something along the lines of you must stay 500 feet or whatever away from this person blah 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 etc and it applies everywhere it applies in all the places because of course it does they provided him a copy, and I was determined the order extended to Michigan, presumably by, you know, reading it. Law enforcement officers arrested the respondent. He was released in the custody of the University Police Department and transported to an airport to board a flight back to California. Okay. So now we're finally going to get to the Title IX cause of action. So now we're finally getting to all that. We're now going to sue the university for their power. So, you know, for, fa for failure to do stuff. So the court's ability to do stuff was apparently much wider than the university's is for some reason. So Forrest brought this action under Title IX. The court explained that as a result of universities promptly compassionately. Okay, the dis the di okay, wow, the district court the district court granted the motion for summary judgment to the university. The court explained that as a result of the university providing prompt compassion and effective relief, the respondent's text messages to Forrester, his Facebook messages messaging her, and physical interaction were all but stopped. I don't know, district court. I don't know, man. I mean, at least, well, I you know, I I'm. 
I don't know. I mean, you know, I am really, I am reading the relaying of the case as decided by the court of appeals that outranks you. So the court of appeals apparently disagrees with your assessment of the case. Uh, the, the, I mean, I've been reading the court of appeals decision for a little bit now, and at least based on my reading of the court of appeals decision, I think it would be a little much to say the interaction had all but stopped. Um, unless we have a very, very, very loose definition of all, by, all but stopped. If by all by it stopped, we meant continue going exactly as it had before, then sure. But other than that, you know, the Court of Appeals doesn't seem to be having any of it. Any of it so, you know, not sure what you were looking at, District Court, but holy Lord. So now we have to get into the Title IX standard. Is the university liable for any of this stuff? Oof. In Davis versus Monroe, Supreme Court held Title IX may support a claim against a recipient of federal funding for student-on-student -student sexual harassment. All right, so to answer someone's earlier question about like, why is this covered by Title IX? Because where's the discrimination on the basis of sex? Here's the answer to the question from earlier in the chat. Here's the question, the answer. Why is this Title IX? Well, here's your answer. In Davis versus Monroe County, the Supreme Court held Title IX may support a claim against a receipt of federal funding for student-on-student -student sexual harassment. The Supreme Court said so. There you go, there's your answer. That was easy. When they can show that the sexual harassment was so severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive, it could be said to deprive plaintiff of access to an educational opportunity, that the funding recipient had actual knowledge of sexual harassment, and the funding recipient was deliber deliberately indifferent. Only on the third prong, the one most relevant here, a plaintiff may show deliberate indifference, where a respondent's response to the harassment or lack thereof is clearly unreasonable in the light of known circumstances. The, different, the deliberate indifference at, miss, at a minimum causes a student to undergo harassment or make them likable or liable or vulnerable. A school need not engage in particular disciplinary action to avoid liability, but where a school district has actual knowledge that efforts to remediate are ineffective and continues to use the same methods, the school has acted with deliberate indifference. Uh, Matt, you, Matt you, stop, you have to stop asking me really insane hypotheticals about embassies, Matt. I don't know, but presumably, yes, even in embassies, because it's an order against you personally. And at least as to, at least as to U.S. law, I don't know if this is uniquely U.S. law thing, but it is, it is well established, it is well established as a matter of U.S. law that the U.S. law can continue to buy you, bind you as a U.S. American anywhere in the world, all the places, all the places in the world. So one of the things that, for example, exists is a law dealing with um, trafficking, sex trafficking as it relates to minors. And it, among other things, makes it illegal for a person in the United States to visit a foreign country for the purposes of engaging in sex tourism. And you might say to yourself, wait a second, this happened fully within the bounds of another country subject to their laws. And the courts say, aha, but you're a US citizen. And that means the US government gets to control you everywhere, all the places. So yes, I assume this restraining order would apply in an embassy, in Antarctica, on a space station, and all the other places. Because US law gets to touch you everywhere, all the places. So, you know, it's one, of the, it's one of the perks slash drawbacks of being a citizen of the United States. They have jurisdiction over you everywhere. The Supreme Court has acknowledged that in an appropriate case, there's no reason why courts on a motion to dismiss for summary judgment or directive verdict could not identify a response that's not clearly unreasonable as a matter of law. Whether a school belatedly stepped up its efforts were too little too late, however, may be a question for a jury. So yeah, the, the, the issue as to like whether it was too much or too little or too little too late or stuff sounds like factual based questions, right? Because we're assuming a whole bunch of facts here we haven't had a trial yet so we're assuming a whole bunch of facts but yeah if we show the right facts it could be a problem again i don't know that this is a specifically u.s law aspect it is i i don't know that it's only the u.s but if it's not only the u.s it's one of like one or two other countries but it is like one of two other countries where the u.s will charge you tax no matter where you live and no matter where you earned money so that is a relatively unique u.s feature most countries most countries in the world do not charge you income tax if you're a citizen of that country, but you earned your money overseas, the U.S. does, but most countries don't. But you know, in in general, I don't know how weird it is for other countries to bind you to their law as you're traveling around the world. I don't know how unique that is or not. Um, you know, if I had to guess, I'd imagine that there's some laws that in most countries that are similar, but I'd be guessing. I don't know. Five dollars from Furby Slayer. A Canadian kills American in Mexico. All three countries have a claim on the case that has been to be determined by some court or claim or treaty. Yes, it is quite possible. It is quite possible that all three countries would have a claim. 
Um, it is quite possible. Yes, the Mexican government has jurisdiction because the crime occurred in Mexico. The U.S. government has jurisdiction because a U.S. citizen is involved. Um, well, they, I don't know that they, the U.S. government has... Well, they might, but probably not the U.S. government because only the victim is American. But the Canadians would because the perp perpetrator is Canadian. So, like, yeah. So, yeah, if a Canadian kills an American in Mexico, then Canadian government has jurisdiction and the Mexican government has jurisdiction... And the U.S. government might, but I'd be less sure about that. It's possible, but I'd have to look into it more. The university has waived any argument that sexual harassment experienced by Foster was not severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive. As Foster correctly points out in its motion for summary judgment for the district court, the university did not argue that Foster was not the victim of student-on-student -student sexual harassment. Seems that way. Indeed, even on appeal, the university does not meaningly contest Foster's ability to satisfy the requirement. In its brief, the university states, without elaboration or further argument, Foster cannot establish that after the university had actual notice of the harassment, she experienced severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive behavior that deprived her of access to educational opportunities. Really, though? Oh yeah, no, we can throw in some we can throw in some fun stuff too. So, yeah, so we can we can make this happen on a boat that is flagged of a different country in the economic waters of a different country. You know, we could we could get some interesting hypotheticals going on here, you know, if we really want to stretch the balance of stuff. So, yeah. It happened on an aircraft carrier that's flagged under one country, and for reasons that pass understanding, it also happened inside an aircraft that is flagged of a different country, even though it's on an aircraft carrier. Don't worry about it. Which is in the land, which is in the seas of another country, which is of this country, and involves citizens of, like, yeah, we could, we could get crazy on all kinds of hypotheticals. It could get weird, yeah. Let's just throw in some pirates while we're at it, too, just for the heck of it. That'll be good. The only subsequent reference to the issue is a footnote in which the university claims because of any interactions between Foster and the respondent during commencement weekend did not constitute a severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive sexual harassment. Foster's failure to demonstrate that she was denied access to educational opportunities provides an alternative ground for affirming the district court's opinion. Even if the university had not waived the argument, however, we could not conclude that as a matter of law, Foster fails to demonstrate severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive sexual harassment. In assessing the severity, we look to something more than just juvenile behavior among students, even behavior that's antagonistic, non-consensual, and crass. In assessing pervasiveness, we look for multiple instances of harassment. One incident of harassment is not enough. In assessing objective offensiveness, we look to behavior that would be offensive to a reasonable person under the circumstances, not merely offensive to the victim personally or subjectively. Although the causation element of foster deliberate indifference claim is limited to the university's actions after Farage reported the respondent's conduct to the university as discussed below, the analysis of the severity, pervasiveness, and objective offensiveness of the harassment is not limited to events post-dating. Thus, we must conclude that the full scope of respondent's behavior towards foster, meaning harassment before and after report, were severe and objectively offensive for the Title IX purposes. Because again, remember, we haven't had trials, so we're assuming things in the light most favorable to the non-moving side. So we assume basically everything Forrest says is true. And so that's kind of the position we're in. From his physical misconduct in the winter of 2013 to his disparaging beret of emails to cast classmates and professors about Forrest in 2014, the response behavior clearly rose to that of actual sexual harassment. The argu university argues no contrary, nothing to the contrary. Okay. Okay, Matt. Let's make let's let's make Matt let's make Matt's life let's make Matt's life as a law student just go completely to shit. Let's make his life completely go to shit in, in, in a hypothetical I'm going to create just to make his life a total nightmare. Here's your here's your exam question, Matt. Matt, all right. Here's your exam question. All right, we got we got a, a we got a person who has joint citizenship of Portugal and Russia, who is located in the United States who is interacting with a person of joint citizenship from Spain and South Sudan in the United States. And um, they're on a parcel of land, which uh, has some interesting qualities to it, Matt. It has interesting qualities. Would you like to know about these interesting qualities? I'm going to tell you about these interesting qualities, Matt. It has an it is, it's a very, very interesting parcel of land, Matt. This parcel of land has a whole bunch of different claims to it. First of all, we got some federal law claim issues because, of course, this is Native American land. And also, it's of competing tribes. Uh, so we got some competing tribes of competing land. Also, did I mention that this land stratifies multiple state lines? Yes, this land is, is across multiple state lines at the exact same time. And um, also, on this piece of land that I'm creating, um, wouldn't you know it? Wouldn't you know it? There's some problems with the title map. There's some problems with the title map. 
You know, over the years, over the years, this this piece of land, which you know just so happened to occur on this piece of land, Matt, it's just it's just a total shame. This piece of land um, has been the subject of some uh, original jurisdiction suits between the states trying to determine where the land land boundary is, which has still not really been resolved by the U.S. Supreme Court. And also, incidentally, um, this t piece of land um, has been the subject of uh, multiple different title issues. Um, you know, there have been people. Who have been um, getting title and stuff? There's been people who have sold this land to more than one person, but so they sold it one person first, but the other person got to the courthouse first to register the land, you know that kind of thing. And also, then you know, there's someone who's put in a quick claim deed, but the quick claim deed seems to have been fraudulently gotten, and that person sold it to someone else, and so we got an issue of estoppel there. Matt, are you following all this so far? Okay. And then on this piece of land, you know, in, in this in this in this world. Um, you know, we, we've we've got it, it got issues as it relates to um, Fourth Amendment issues because you know we're not really sure where this is and stuff like that. And and also incidentally, uh, you know, it's actually the UN. Don't ask why the UN is operating in the United States. Don't ask questions like that. But the UN was the person who conducted the arrest. But it was a U.S. soldier in the UN who conducted the arrest. But they were authorized by law because I don't know coronavirus or something. And so they're they're, they're being arrested. And um, so I want you to analyze. Um, the property interests of everyone involved. I want you to determine who has land of it. Oh, and also, did I mention, by the way, that someone's been sitting on this land for 21 years, although they once went on a vacation for three months, and they claim that they own the land because of um, uh, because of um, of, of uh, adverse possession. So I'd like you to determine who owns this wonderful piece of land, what state it's in, what jurisdiction it applies, and what claims, if any, and defenses can be offered by all the people involved. Can you do that for me, Matt? Turn that in for me in 30 minutes. That'd be great. There's your final exam answer. Do that shit for me. Uh, <laughs> uh, in, in Forrest's claim, in Forrest's case of March the 13th, 2014, the university acquired actual knowledge of the month-long campaign of sexual harassment by a respondent against Forrest and implemented a response. The respondent thereafter violated the no-contact order by sending Forrest a text message announcing his indication to violate the order again in an erratic late-night email to the university administrators, tagging Forrest in a threatening post on Facebook, sending retaliatory and harassing emails to Forrest claims and professors after he was barred for the final day of April's residency, and appeared in the same room as Forrest as commenced activities after being prohibited from the attendant commencement. Whether considering the parse March 13th conduct alone or in full timeline respondents' behavior, it's clear this harassment of Forrest was pervasive. Also, 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 Matt, also, Matt, also, Matt, I, I, I didn't actually make clear the actual cause of the, uh, the actual call of the question. So, you know, this, this final exam answer I've decided is now being, dra uh, has now been drafted by a sovereign citizen. So here's your actual call, call of the question. Discuss the implications of this under the UCC. Go. <laughs> oh, man. Whew. As, as far as lawyer Hubert go, Huber goes, that was pretty funny. Oh, man. As a general matter, the university does not deny it has actual knowledge of harassment. Still, for the purpose of assessing whether a jury could conclude the university was deliberately indifferent, two points about the university's level and timing of knowledge are worth clarifying. First, on March the 18th, 2014, Forrest made the university aware of hundreds of text messages respondent had sent to her as an email attachment shown. From the very moment onward, the university had actual knowledge of the pre-report harassment. Matt, Matt, Matt has given up. That's okay. I, I don't remember the question, but I did have a black acre question on my exam on my uh, bar exam. I do remember there's a black acre question on my bar exam. I don't remember what it was, but you know, of course, it was a black acre question. So that was part of what inspired me. Well, I you know, I I wanted I was hoping that you'd go more into sovereign citizen land, and you know, use sovereign citizen logic in your analysis. So, you know, because, you know, all right, well, whatever. Okay, fine, Matt. Discuss the implications under the Magna Carta then. Go. The central issue in this case is whether the university was deliberately indifferent to the respondent's harassment of Forrest after he signaled he would not comply. As discussed above, Forrest does not argue the nature or extent of respondent's pre-March 13th conduct toward her should he let the university respond differently at the moment she filed the report. 
Rather, Forrest frames the issue as whether the university's subsequent actions were adequate and effective once the university was aware that the harasser was not complying with the no-contact order. We first assess the various actions by a respondent and the university responses to them, specifically inquiring whether responses were not, as a matter of law, clearly unreasonable in light of known circumstances, thus demonstrating the school's deliberate indifference to foreseeability possibility of further action. We then I, I'm not I'm not really I'm not really feeling I'm not really feeling the spirit here from Ewim. I'm not really feeling the spirit here. You know. We then Assess whether the responses did not, as a matter of law, cause further inquiry injury to Forrest, such that the injury attributable is to post knowledge further harassment, which would not have happened but for clear unreasonableness. In brief, a reasonable jury could conclude the university was deliberately indifferent in responding to the ongoing escalating campaign of harassment. So basically saying that this is just a jury question, and ultimately at the end of the day, it's like who believes what as to what. But it sounds like, you know, this person has a fair amount of evidence of the stuff that happens, and the university doesn't have a whole lot of stuff about what it did. So, you know, not seeing it going completely well for the university, but like, you know, it, it's amazing the university didn't do more because, you know, they, they usually do. First, Forrest argues that after a respondent texted her on March 29th in violation of no conduct, the university did not take any immediate action and did not make any substantive changes in the conditions, despite her complaints that they did not address her safety. Although the university's email included a robust set of conditions by which the respondent was to abide, Forrest is correct the university did not take any immediate action with respect to the order. In assessing these two incidents, it is true that a reasonable jury could regard the respondent's March 29th text message violation as de minimis, given the message contained only one word and no explicit threat, and could regard April 4th's email as inappropriate, yet not violative of the order, given that the email was not addressed to Forrest, and it would only signal respondent's intention to violate the no contact or if certain conditions were satisfied. A juror might therefore regard the university's minimal response as commensurate with a minimal level of harassment. Yet a reasonable jury could also conclude that in light of the extended pattern of sexual harassment, these two incidents manifested a clear intention to subject Forrest to further harassment, warranting a swift and severe response from the university as means of deterring further misconduct. After all, the only evidence before the court of the university's response was the talking to the respondent, which does seem a little insufficient given what we know. In our view, whether the incidents of post-report harassment that befall Forrest were traceable to the university's response is a question for the jury. Although a court may grant summary judgment on an issue of causation when warranted, ordinarily causation is a question to be resolved by the jury. Did the university's minimal response to respondent first violation of the no contact order and crude threatening email lead to subsequent violations when he tied her on Facebook referred to her as a scrub and threatened her boyfriend? Did the university's response embolden respondent to engage in retaliation against her by derogatory comments about her in emails? Did the university's failure to institute more severe disciplinary and precautionary measures about the respondent's state intention for Michigan to graduation lead to his appearance in the same room? These are genuine disputes over questions which a jury should answer. We hold a university's responses to foregoing conduct by the respondent may have been clearly unreasonable, despite the fact that the harm suffered was less severe than other cases and belated responses may have ultimately stopped certain forms of harassment from continuing. So that is the end of the current coverage of the case of Rebecca Forrest versus the Board of Regents of the University of Michigan. In this case, we learned that Miss Forrest had a uh, classmate that was treating her, treating her in a very disrespectful way. And despite many, many attempts, it didn't stop. And despite going to the university, it didn't stop. It didn't stop until eventually we got a court order to make it stop. So on this particular one, we try to figure out if the university is responsible. And so to do that, we, we have to go back to the trial and figure out whether the university had deliberate indifference. That is, was the university doing its best? Were they trying reasonable steps? Or did they just not care one way or another to lead to a timeline violation? So that's the end of our current coverage. Thank you for joining me as we both read this case together and now better understand the law. If you're enjoying this legal education content, please subscribe to this channel. It really helps us grow. And check out one of our other videos, including the one that's currently being displayed on the thumbnail on screen. Thank you so much for your continued support. And until later, my friends, cheers and goodbye.